Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Popham Colony was the vanguard of a new colonization model for the English, the result of rights stripped from noblemen and redistributed to new corporate entities. After years of sailors kidnapping natives off the coast of modern-day Maine to train as interpreters, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias and Sir John Popham returned them, hoping the fair treatment given to their captives would foster goodwill with their native communities. Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast continues his telling of this incredible story. John Popham dies June 10th, 1607. The main financial backer of the colony is no more. So who stepped in to fill his void? Well, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, of course. As soon as he heard of Popham's death, he took control of all preparations, all operations, all resupply plans and prepared letters explaining his plan and reassuring the settlers of such to be taken over during these resupplies. And so we tend to call this the Popham Colony, because of the main financial backer, John Popham, George Popham being its leader, but I could argue that it could be called the Gorgeous Colony, or the Ferdinando Colony. This may be the first of many examples where Gorgeous's legacy is swept right under the rug. But let's get back to our colonists. In August, they hit the coast of what we would now call Maine. By August 20th, they decided on their site to build their colony. They chose an easily defensible peninsula called Sabino Head on the Sagadahawk River. Keeping defenses in mind, they immediately started building what they called Fort St. George, a far more impressive structure than the colonists at Jamestown would be building. The records seem to indicate that Riley Gilbert, on his boat, came a little bit later than Popham, which of course is when the rivalry would really kick in. Popham, probably anticipating this rivalry, on August 22nd, before Riley showed up, took a shallop and began to explore the coast. Making contacts with some natives, he learned that there had recently been a very large war in the area that was caused by the murder of a chief's son. In other words, this was a blood feud. These things are seasonal, unstoppable. There's almost no way to win one without causing another one. This was not a good omen for George Popham, so he returned the very next day. Riley shows up before the 28th, and he organizes his own expedition. He takes 15 of the 100 or so men with him. Lots of people have written about this rivalry, and some take the opinion that he organized his own expedition as a way to rival or outshine George's short little trip. But in all practicality, they had to make contact with the natives, they had to map the area, they had to know where they were. And while Riley was gone, the colonists began to make earthen works and closures around the settlement, erect the buildings, including a storehouse, the entire fort itself with its walls, and they seem to have been very industrious during this time. Which gets to two other issues. One of the colonists, by the name of John Hunt, he made a sketch of the fort. And that sketch somehow made it to the King of Spain. And that's really the depiction we have of what they ended up building. That's really all we have as evidence as to what it looked like, how big it was, how grand it was in scale, how many structures were there. We only have this map that was somehow given to the King of Spain. Espionage, of course. But it begs the question, was this everything they planned to build? Or was this everything they managed to build? I think the jury's still out. But another thing the colonists did, they immediately started building a ship, a seaworthy vessel. Again, nobody's doing this kind of stuff in Jamestown yet. During the 19th century, shortly after the Civil War, historians and educators in Massachusetts were very proud of the Plymouth Colony, which of course by that point had been absorbed by Massachusetts. And there were a series of open letters published in the papers between historians and authorities in Maine and those in Massachusetts debating the nature of the Popham Colony. The Civil War had tarnished the image of Jamestown and the South in general, obviously, and all the things that came from it and the institution of slavery. Historians were now looking to New England as the origin story of the United States, Plymouth being the beachhead, the vanguard. But there were a few in Maine who pointed out, hey, the first English settlement in this part of the continent was Popham, the Popham Colony, or the Sagadahawk Colony. Many of the people in Massachusetts argued, wait a minute, Sir John Popham was the head of the judicial branch of the English government at the time. He had nothing to do with colonial endeavors. So how did he populate these colonies? How did he get people who were willing to go on these crazy trips? Well, the colonists were all prisoners, or most of them were prisoners, and this was some sort of penal colony. That's how the people in Massachusetts in the 19th century, that's how they tried to soil Popham. But the records don't seem to show that. And generally, if you're taken somewhere against your will because you're a prisoner and already some sort of criminal or low-life scum, you're not very productive. 
And that shows in the colony. Let's jump right back to the Popham colony. They're building a fort. They're building earthen works. They're going out on expeditions. And they built a seaworthy vessel. All before winter. I think we can conclude that these were no criminals. These were hardworking men. And the Popham colony had a lot of potential right off the bat. At least in the people. The location, very debatable. Considering the trouble that Champlain had and his companions at St. Croix. An island, not a peninsula, but pretty similar to the uh, Popham geography. There were far better spots up the river. The site was on a barren, windswept, rocky point, fully exposed to winter storms. Maine looks awfully nice in August. But now let's turn to our native passenger on our way over from England. Now back in the vicinity of his people, the English beg him to help them make contact with a nearby village, some group of natives in the area. And the village they end up finding is where Tahanendo, who was also taken previously and brought back about a year before this point in time, was Sagamore. He was chief once more of this village, despite being absent for a time. As soon as Tahaendo sees the English, he comes running at them with a number of braves and confronts them. Now on his home turf, he's not so friendly to the English anymore. It's only with all of the good gestures and friendly motions given by the English that Tahaendo's men relax. There was a tense interaction, but it was the beginning of relations, at least as far as the English thought. They came back two days later. Same reaction from Tahaendo. He knew who this group was, but he showed up again with his warriors. Again, they had to convince them of their peaceful intentions. And again, they had a short conversation. This time, however, their interpreter asked to stay with this village of people where Tahaendo was chief. The English finally agree, and then Tahaendo agrees to return after a certain number of days. He does not. And when the English go to investigate, they find the whole village has been abandoned. The people, rather than deal with the English, retire to the interior of Maine. And with them, their interpreter. The fallout from this was felt immediately. September 1st, 1607. The first natives show up at the actual Fort St. George, at the Popham Colony. It was just a man in his canoe, but the canoe already had brass kettles in it. Indicating, of course, that European trade had already been strong and vibrant in the area. One of the Englishmen stepped forward to try to coax the man closer with peaceful gestures. The man came a little bit closer. Their interactions were brief because now they don't have interpreters. And the man got in his canoe and promptly disappeared. The fact that he had the kettles would indicate to me that he was probably caught unawares. Wherever he was returning from, wherever he got those kettles, last time he came that way, the Popham colony didn't exist. And now it did, and he was curious and still very skeptical. It would be four days later on September 5th when nine canoes arrived right at Popham. There were about 40 people total, men, women, and children. Normally with these cross-cultural exchanges, if you show up someplace with women and children, it's a general sign that we come in peace. Lo and behold, they were led there by Tahiendo and their interpreter. And they offered to the English to introduce them to Bashaba the paramount sagamore of the Abenaki. In return for food, the English smelling a genuine opportunity here, they agree. They have a massive feast that night. And as a gesture of this opening relationship, some of the natives spend the night at Fort St. George. Meanwhile, some of the English spend the night at the native encampment right next door. And after the English had laden their canoes with food, the chief turned English captive, turned chief again, arranges for the English to meet him at a designated location in three days, at which point the English party would be led to the great Sagamore of the Abenaki. Things are looking awfully grand for the people of Popham. So two days later, on September 7th, there were enough buildings in the colony constructed that they were finally able to completely unload their boats with all of their supplies, providing a little textual evidence that they really did an impressive amount of construction in a very short amount of time, and also that these probably weren't common criminals. And then the very next day on September 8th, Gilbert is charged with taking 22 men with him and sailing to the rendezvous spot. Popham probably happy to get rid of him for a little while. But when they get to the spot, no one is there. They had been stood up. But to make sure, they stay there three days and they exhaust their supplies. They weren't planning on being gone that long. That's when Gilbert realized that all the food they had given them before, all the promises, it was all for naught. It was just a scam to load up on these hearty staple foods that would help the natives through winter. Gilbert and his party limp home. 
A couple weeks later, on the 23rd of September, Gilbert again is sent out. Some sources insisted that he sent himself out. Either way, Popham again was sending him away on a mission to keep him out of his hair, or Gilbert himself was organizing this effort in order to demonstrate his leadership. But as you can imagine, a end of September in northern Maine, the little hints of winter are starting to peek through in the weather, and so Gilbert figured he'd better get out there and explore while he still had the chance. Two days into his expedition, while camping at night, he hears somebody calling out to them in the far distance, in what they describe as broken English. Just one voice. They respond back, and then nothing. The next day, four men show up at the English camp. The leader introduces himself to Riley as a man by the name of Sibanoa, who calls himself the Lord of the River, Sagadahawk, and he wanted to know why the English had come. Now, the Gilberts and the Rileys and the Gorges and their whole extended family, they're smart people. And remember, Sebanoa is not the name given by the other group of natives for the Sagamore of the Abenaki. Also, as they all learned very early on, there had recently been a very large war in the area. And then finally, there's only four of these guys. How is he lord of the whole Sagadahawk River when his entourage is himself and three dudes? They had a light conversation for a while, but it was clear to Riley that although this guy knows some English, he's trying to get something over on him. And he knows well the ignorance that Europeans have of this area of the continent. So Riley politely starts moving his group back onto his ship. But then the natives rush into the water and they try to take hold of the shallop. The English try to brush them off. It doesn't work. They're really determined to either take the ship or get on the ship or something. Resorting to a volley of their muskets, Riley's men finally send the natives into a full-on retreat. Perhaps some sort of victory, but a, another failed interaction with the Native Americans. Then on October 3rd, Skidaware shows up again at the Popham Colony with a different group of people. They stay for two days and actually attend Sunday church service at the little chapel the English had built. On the third day, Dahendo shows up with who is supposedly Bashaba's brother. Bashaba, of course, being the Sagamore of the Abenaki. The English lavish Bashaba's brother with gifts, hoping that this would open up a permanent line of communication at last. Also, some trading seems to have been done between this last interaction with the natives and the earlier ones, because in October, the Popham colony sends the Mary and John back to England full of furs. <laughs> I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 